Hello, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, this is Paul Liu from NC State University. Uh, once again, welcome you to this World River Delta Source to Sync webinar series. And so uh, uh, today uh, we are very happy uh, to invite Dr. Sophie Hajj from IFML, France, come here talk about uh, the organic carbon from source to sink in uh, Canada Inlet, built Inlet. So before I introduce Sophie, I would like to mention again, uh, this talk series already just uh, uh, more than a year. In the past, uh, we have 90 talks already archived on our YouTube channel. So you are welcome freely to use as a resources for teaching and research. So just uh, go to the YouTube um, source to sync uh, the channel. And at the same time, once again, we also maintain a Twitter account source to sync. As you can see all the, uh, the news, the talk we are posted there. You can get update if you follow us. And uh, so, uh, Next, oh, next week, the uh, same time, we will have Professor Jifei Liu from Tongji University come here talk about source to sink transport, um, the fluvial sediment in the South China Sea. So please mark your calendar. But uh, as I will like to point out, because this coming weekend, US will end our summer saving time. So the Beijing time, the talk will be 10 p.m. I'm sorry for our Chinese colleagues, but uh, uh, well, hopefully uh, uh, like before, many of you still can stay up, uh, but if you cannot, all the talk will be archived also, not only on YouTube, but uh, on the Billy Billy station. Okay, uh, so you can see the, the slide, right? Sophie, you can see that, no? Yes, I can see it now. <laughs> okay, how about now? Can you? Yep. yep. Okay. So, uh, um, Sophie, um, as I point out, uh, at the, uh, or originally, she's from Belgium, from University of uh, Leipzig, and uh, then, she went to, uh, she got his bachelor and a master over there, Belgium, then went to the UK University of Southampton for PhD in marine sedimentology, and then went to Canada, uh, uh, Calgary for a postdoc associate, now in EFML for a postdoc fellow, a uh, very rich international experience. So, uh, Sophie, now uh, you can share your screen and uh, we're looking forward to your talk. Okay, thanks. Uh, so screen two. Can you see my first slide yes. for screen now? Okay. Yes, yes. I'm just gonna move the video. Right. So thanks, Paul. Um, thanks and uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for, for having me and for the introduction as well. That's a, it's a great chance and a great opportunity for, for me to, to talk in this uh, webinar series. And um, yeah, today I'd like to show you um, how Butte Inlet, which is a fjord in uh, British Columbia, Canada, uh, can be used as, as a field scale laboratory for the, for the study of organic carbon from source to sink uh, in the marine environment. Uh, but first of all, I also would like to thank and acknowledge the different people involved in, in this work. So they are listed on, the, on this first slide. And uh, I'd like also to thank the different institutions that have allowed me to conduct my research uh, so far. Uh, and so I'll start with a very uh, a broad introduction. So why do we want to study organic carbon in marine sediments? Um, and I guess I'll give you two reasons here uh, that span different time scales. So on short time scales, um, particulate organic matter and, and carbon constitute the primary energy source for life in, in deep sea sediments. 
Whereas on much longer time scales, the burial of this terrestrial organic carbon in marine sediment, which is produced by consumption of atmospheric CO2 on land, uh, can lead to a drawdown of this atmospheric CO2 when the organic matter is trapped within the seabed sediment. And so we are thus dealing here with a, a long-term uh, carbon cycle uh, that involves the biosphere, the atmosphere, and, and sediment as well, and, and from which um, carbon can be locked out for geologic timescales. And um, a global study by uh, Smith et al. in 2015 um, has shown that fields actually contribute 11% of this uh, organic carbon burial in marine sediment, uh, constituting then organic carbon burial hotspots. So this is the number of, of, of fjords that um, uh, Smith et al. Have, have studied for the global uh, database. And following this study, a few more um, uh, study cases have quantified the amount of carbon uh, buried in fjord sediments with numbers that can reach up to 100 tons of carbon per square kilometers per year that was demonstrated in the fjords of, uh, of Scotland and Ireland by uh, uh, Smithen and Austin. But these studies are actually based on individual um, sediment cores, which are composed, which can be composed of a wide range of grain size. So grain size classes have been taken into account, but, but those studies also um, often lack detailed bathymetric maps that would represent the large scale heterogeneity of, of, of field seafloors. So we know that they can be made of different grain size, but what, what, what about the, the seafloor map? And so in, these, in this presentation, um, I'd like to focus on a particular type of fjords, uh, which include networks of, of submarine channels, terraces, and lobes that are formed by uh, turbidity currents. And uh, such systems have been uh, widely mapped in the fjords of uh, British Columbia and Canada um, using multi-beam surveys. So you see here the study by um, Conway et al. in 2012, uh, who have shown um, different incised submarine channels that are meandering from the, the deltas at the head of, of different fjords, and then uh, further downstream, they, deposit, they have depositional lobes that are similar to, to deep sea settings. And so within those fjord uh, turbidite systems, uh, my questions for, for these presentations, uh, for this presentation will be uh, simple. Um, so, so how does organic carbon transport and burial work in, in fjord turbidite systems? And, and what are the organic carbon fluxes uh, compared to those that we've saw on the, in the slides before? What will be the organic carbon fluxes in those turbidite systems uh, in, in fjords? And so to answer these sort of, these sort of uh, questions, um, I'm going to show you data from uh, Butte Inlet, which is quite a unique uh, site to study. So it's, it's one of those uh, British Columbia fjords in Canada. Um, and it has uh, two uh, river sources, the Omatko here and the Southgate, uh, that are uh, feeding sediment into the fjord head. Um, so two river sources, it also has a, a 40 kilometer long uh, submarine channel that is meandering and incising the fjord seafloor. You can see it highlighted in black and yellow here. And then we have a 600 meters deep marine sink below here. Um, and this fjord has been uh, studied for several decades now, uh, since the uh, early 50s actually. Um, and a lot of uh, a suite of instruments uh, have been used uh, and using state-of-the-art methods such as uh, multi-beams, current meters, acoustic Doppler current providers, sediment curing. Um, everything has been tested in, in this field pretty much uh, since the 50s. And um, using these tools, uh, turbidity currents processes, so the, flow, the active flows and the products, the, the deposits, have been uh, connected in, in great detail. Um, and, and because this fjord is relatively small compared to deep sea setting, and it has also submarine channels, lobes, and terraces that, that are quite similar to the ones we see in deep sea setting, we can say that we can use it as a field scale lab uh, to study organic carbon from source to sink more generally, um, and uh, particularly in turbidity current systems. Um, and so in this second part of the, of the presentation, I will provide you with a bit more context on this uh, beauty inlet setting uh, and its uh, submarine morphology. And so, as I mentioned uh, earlier, beauty inlet is fed by two main uh, rivers that are called Omatko and Southgate. So the Omatko watershed is uh, three times larger than the Southgate watershed, and it has also been gauged for decades 
uh, the Amatco River. Uh, it's not the case for the Southgate, but um, um, increasing work by the Haikai uh, Institute have, uh, has allowed to actually um, measure uh, the river discharge uh, for both the Amatco and the Southgate and to then uh, calculate fluxes, fl uh, flow in, in cubic meters per second. Um, and so you see here uh, that the peaks in river discharge occur in the freshet in spring and summer, uh, following the melting of the glaciers uh, in the area. So be about between early May to October, we have higher river discharge in those two rivers. And concerning the, uh, regarding the uh, seafloor of Butte Inlet, I would say that it's quite heterogeneous. And um, it's actually incised by a sandy submarine channel that you can see here meandering in, in yellow. You have a few zooms in uh, on the left-hand side of the slide. And this channel uh, covers only 4% of the total uh, fjord area. Then we have terraces and overbanks that are muddy and they cover 27% of the fuel total area. Uh, we then have a, a depositional lobe, sandy lobe in here, uh, which uh, contributes 5% of the total area. And then finally, the muddy distal area here, uh, highlighted in, in, in brown, um, contributes the remain 21% of the fuel, sorry. And, and the rest of the fjord area corresponds to the steep sidewall um, which I'm going to discard in the rest of the presentation. We don't have data here, and, and I'm not going to, to show you organic carbon data in, in the side walls. Um, and I'd like to draw really your, your attention on this tiny, well, narrow submarine channel, uh, which I've shown you on the previous slide, uh, because it's actually really active. It has uh, zones of erosion and deposition that migrate upstream, so um, on, on the left-hand side of this slide, you see red zones and blue zones, uh, which were compiled using two bathymetric surveys. So we've made a difference map between the survey uh, taken in 2016 and we, uh, we minus the survey in, in 2008. Uh, and so we end up with blue zones, which correspond zone of, uh, to zones of uh, net accumulation of sediments, whereas the red zone corresponds to re uh, zones of removal of sediments, to erosion. And, um, and so these zones of erosion and deposition are due to the presence of steep steps in the channel gradient, which we call neck points. And which you can see here on this animation showing different survey in a specific area of the uh, channel, you can see that the steep phase, the neck point, migrate upstream as we go through time. And so this is, it can reach migration rates of up to 400 meters per year. So that's a really huge a huge activity which constantly uh, rework uh, the um, submarine channel. And this, uh, these zones of erosion, deposition, or in other words, those neck points migration events, they are actually due to fast moving turbidity currents uh, triggered off the deltas at the fjord head. Uh, I'm not going to enter into the details of how turbidity currents are, are triggered, uh, but, but we know they are linked to the river activity. Um, and so they, these flows, these stability currents, have been monitored in detail in, in Butte Inlet uh, using um, acoustic Doppler current profilers, which can measure the velocity of particles moving through one point, for example, in here, uh, through time. And so you can see here an example of a flow which lasted for two hours. So we have a time series here on the x, x axis, um, and it reached velocities of up to six meters per second. So the red colors here, we have a, a fast head in this current and the height of uh, up to 10 meters um, for, for the flow itself. And so because those processes are really highly active on, on a yearly basis uh, linked to the river discharge activity in Butte Inlet, it is really challenging to calculate uh, sediment accumulation rates over such short time scales. <coughs> so, for example, if we take the net accumulation in the channel over 10 years, uh, we end up with a negative number, which means that erosion dominates uh, over the channel. So rather than using short time scales for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to use sediment accumulation rates over century time scales in the system. So using lead 210 and cesium uh, dating that were conducted uh, on much longer sediment cores in the deep basin and on the muddy uh, terraces. They were conducted by Kate Hirama from Durham University, 
Um, and, and I'm going to assume that the sediment accumulation rates in the channel uh, will reach a similar number to its associated terraces over century time scales. And so the, the number I'll be using uh, in the following slides are uh, an accumulation of about 1.9 centimeters per year in the sandy channel lobe and terraces, so over century time scales, and uh, an accumulation of one centimeter a year for the distal, more quiet environment in, in the field here, based then on, on, on sediment dating. So, and now um, in this new, new part of the presentation, uh, we are going to dive a bit more into the uh, organic uh, geochemistry that we um, conducted on those uh, sediment samples from source to sink in, in Butte Inlet. Now that you know a bit more about um, the, the context of the, of the system, um, I'd like to show you how we studied organic carbon on the river and the seafloor samples that we collected in, in Butte Inlet. And so first of all, on all those samples, um, for which I'll show you the locations later, um, we uh, measured the total organic carbon uh, content using uh, an elemental analyzer. Um, so classically on, on the bulk samples. Then we also measured the, the ratio between carbon stable isotopes compositions called um, delta C13 uh, using a mass spectrometer. And so this delta C13 uh, ratio gives us an indication for the origin of the organic carbon in a sample. So whether it is marine dominated or land derived. But because those bulk TOC, total organic carbon and delta C13 were, were made on, on the bulk samples, they actually only represent the average composition of these bulk samples. But those samples can be made of different carbon pools. So, so we can have uh, fresh terrestrial biospheric carbon, for example, leaves and plants produced in the biosphere. We can have older terrestrial biospheric carbon um, that's being aged in soils. We can also have marine biospheric carbon or petrogenic carbon, which is carbon that is locked in sediment for, for long time scales. And all these pools of carbon can mix to form one bulk samples. And, and those TOC and delta C13 that we measured represent the average between these different carbon types. And so we wanted to push the analysis further and see how much, um, how many types of carbon we have in, in our samples from source to sink in butane lets. And so to separate and identify the different carbon types within each sample, um, we use the REMS pyrolysis oxidation system that was developed at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And this system, um, involves putting a raw sample in a programmable oven, and the, the sample will undergo combustion. So the organic matter will turn into CO2 under a temperature ramp, and we can record the amount of CO2 released using a standard infrared analyzer. And the good thing with this system is that when we use a rather slow temperature ramp, we can trap the different CO2 fractions that have combusted from the organic matter, uh, using cryogenic traps. And uh, the trapped CO2 fractions can then be measured for delta C13 and uh, radiocarbon H to identify their sources. And um, this is what we end up in terms of uh, results from uh, the RPO. So we, we have first a thermogram, which shows the, the amount of CO2 that's being produced uh, through time, through the temperature ramp, the hair in green. And so you see that different peaks of CO2 can, uh, can appear as we um, heat the sample. Uh, this thermogram can be deconvoluted into activation of energy, which corresponds to the energy required for the organic matter to combust. And here uh, you see an example of, of a thermogram or activation energy here um, with the five fractions that were separated for one samples and for which we measured delta C13 values in red. And so you see a wide spectrum of delta C13 values between minus 30 for the last fraction to minus 27 for the mid fraction, but also a range of, of ages. So fraction modern represents the age, the radiocarbon age of the, of the carbon. And you see that the first fraction that has uh, combusted uh, is much younger than the last. So we have a, a spectrum of ages within one sample. And so, Hopefully you, you, you got how we analyzed uh, the different uh, samples uh, using those bulk measurements on, on, as a first step and then those 
more detailed um, fractionations of carbon as a second step. And using those uh, methods and the BUT samples, um, I'm now going to try and answer uh, the following three questions, uh, starting with how much organic carbon is delivered by the rivers, then going to how much is stored, uh, how much and where is organic carbon stored on the seafloor, and then discuss a little bit how our results compare with the previous studies. So first one, how much organic carbon is delivered by the rivers? Um, so on the left-hand side, you have in blue the location of the samples that we collected in the rivers connected to Butte. Um, so we tried to cover the river suspended sediments, uh, the river deltas, the river uh, banks, but also the river plumes that are formed at the surface of the fjord. And showing, showing you here a, a satellite image showing the, the plume of uh, sediments coming in from the river and staying at the fjord surface. So we really have a wide range of grain size and uh, environments from those river samples. Um, but as you can see on this right, on the right hand side, you have the uh, suspended uh, loads from the Omatko uh, River. So this one, this river here. Um, and we only sampled the, the rivers on one day, which was 26th of October 2017, which corresponded to uh, an annual uh, a suspended load discharge of about 30 kilograms per second, I think. And this corresponds to the annual average of the Omatko River. But I'd like to stress here that we only have 24 samples in the rivers and they were um, only collected on one day, which might not be representative of the whole freshet period or more quiet period. Um, and here are the bulk uh, total organic carbon content uh, measured on the river samples. So in gray, uh, you have the uh, muddy plume samples, so at the fjord surface, uh, which show extremely high TOC contents of up to 4%. Then in orange, you see the TOC content for the suspended load within the rivers, both Omatko and Southgate, which are about 0.5 to 1% of TOC. And then in yellow, we have the sandy banks and deltas, which have lower TOC content for both rivers. And so if you use the, um, the average sediment discharge and the TOC data, we can derive uh, quite simply a suspended uh, POC flux, particulate organic carbon flux of about 11 uh, kiloton of organic carbon per year uh, for the suspended load and the bed load. And I'm not speaking about the muddy plume here, uh, because it's created, uh, we, we haven't been able to, to uh, characterize its flux and it's created within the field. Um, so that's just a table to show you the different numbers behind those uh, calculations. And I'll show you now um, the carbon stable isotope results on the river samples in this uh, total carbon, one over TC, one over total carbon, versus delta C13 uh, diagram, which I'd like you to get used to because you'll see it a lot in the rest of, of the presentation. And I'll start with uh, plotting the river suspended samples. So the fine sands in orange uh, crosses, um, which have a quite moderate um, carbon content. And delta C13 between minus 28 and minus 24 uh, per mil which are uh, typical for land produced organic matter. And then we have a few uh, coarse sand samples that are really low in organic carbon. Uh, and they also show a terrestrial origin in terms of delta C13 values. If we go a bit further, we'll add the ramped oxidation data that we have acquired on those river samples, on some of them at least. Um, so on the two, top two panels, uh, you're seeing the suspended fine sands which have uh, fractions uh, that we've been able to divide into five fractions each. And they have a wide range of ages uh, going from younger to older within the fractions. On the bottom two panels, uh, we don't have radiocarbon ages. They correspond to the samples that are really sandy and coarse that have really low TOC content. So there wasn't enough material uh, to measure uh, radiocarbon. Uh, but we see that the, the, there are peaks at very high temperatures in here, uh, which represents rather refractory uh, organic carbon. Um, and so let's, and so using this different um, uh, information, we've been able to identify a petrogenic pool of organic carbon within the uh, coarse sands, and then a more terrestrial biospheric pool with a, with a different ages 
uh, for the organic matter um, within the fine sands. And so let's now take a look to those uh, muddy plume uh, samples, which um, just to remind you, they are located at the fjord surface. So they, they, they stay, uh, they don't really sink, they stay at the fjord surface. And, um, and the, the, these samples show extremely high organic carbon contents. They, they, they plot towards the, the carbon rich pole of this uh, plot. And they also show uh, unusual delta C13 uh, values between minus 12 to minus 20, 22 um, compared to the, the other river samples. And these values are not usual for terrestrial derived carbon. Um, so we could think, geochemists could think that they could be mixed with carbonate or inorganic carbon that would increase the overall delta C13 content, but this is not the case because we removed the carbonates uh, on all samples before analyzing them. And so if we look at those river plume samples in terms of um, uh, mixtures and, and fractions, we can see that um, we have a, a spectrum of delta C13 values that is quite uh, high between minus uh, 15 and minus 20. We also have um, some uh, CO2 that has combusted at very low uh, temperature compared to the rest of the river samples, um, indicating probably a labile character of the, of the organic matter. Mm -hmm. And we have really modern um, ages for those samples. And um, thinking again about these samples, we remember that when we, we were filtering them on the boat, they were really sticky. They, there was a sort of bluey biofilm uh, on them. And so we think that those um, unusual delta C13 values could be related to the, the production um, of bacterial plankton or associated organic carbon by bacterial plankton. Um, and that was evidenced uh, in the 80s by Elbright, who has uh, uh, demonstrated that there could be some uh, plume of, uh, bloom of bacterial plankton uh, in river ocean plumes uh, in the region. And we haven't pushed the analysis further, but we are really interested in knowing more about uh, those uh, really weird looking delta C13 values for the river plumes. And so in summary, um, for the type and amount of carbon delivered by both rivers at the fjord head, um, we have 11 ton, uh, 11 kilotons, sorry, of organic carbon uh, per year um, that is delivered by the suspended load of the Omatco and Southgate river. This suspended load is uh, ter mainly terrestrial biospheric carbon, which can be old to young, different spectrum of ages. And then we have about 11 kilotons of old carbon to petronic carbon uh, brought in by the river bed loads, so those coal sands. And we haven't been able to quantify the flux of carbon associated with the river plume, um, but we are not considering it as an input flux anyway, because it's produced within the fueled waters. Um, okay. So we'll now, after looking at those uh, rivers in details, uh, we'll now move on to the uh, submarine system in Butte Inlet. And uh, let's wonder how much and where is uh, organic, organic carbon stored on, on the seafloor. And so we'll start with the uh, Sandy submarine channel and the lobe. Uh, which are um, considered together because they show really similar facies in terms of a, of a sediment. Uh, when we retrieved sediment core, we could only retrieve about 30 centimeters long core because they were the base of the, of the core were really sandy. We could not penetrate further. And so you see here those 30 centimeters uh, long uh, log located within the channel talweg and on the lobe for the core seven. Um, and uh, the pie chart here um, confirms that the channel and the lobe are dominated by uh, coarse sands for 63%, uh, followed by fine sands for 29%, and then mud for 8%. And so um, in terms of total organic carbon content, TOC here, um, we have uh, muds that have about 0.5% of TOC, Coral sands have really low uh, TOC content, almost none. And then we have a very interesting peak of high TOC, up to 3% within the fine sands that are located between the coral sands and the mud cap of those turbidites, which will link to turbidity currents. Um, and <clears throat> if we plot those uh, channel and low sandy samples on this TC versus delta C13 diagram, um, so they are plotted here 
on um, as a squares. So in um, the yellow squares represent the uh, core sands that are, are located on the current pole and, and side of the of the diagram and terrestrial origin in uh, ter in terms of delta C thirteen. Then we have the mud caps, which are on the moderate uh, total carbon content and still a terrestrial uh, origin in terms of delta C13, minus 26 to minus 28. And then we have those interesting fine sands that have higher uh, carbon content and that uh, plot towards minus 26 to minus 30 uh, per mil in terms of, of delta C13. And visually, we also uh, found uh, a few woody debris associated within those, with those fine sands that we were able to measure and isolate uh, for delta C13, and they, they, they showed values uh, of about minus 30 per mil. And so we see here that the fine sands tend to be associated with those fresh woody debris. And so basically the takeaway from this, uh, this uh, plot here is that we have a segregation of carbon types uh, associated to, to different grain sites. Um, yeah, and if we now take a look at how these samples look like in, in um, terms of mixtures, using again the REMT oxidation data, uh, we published these, um, these results just for the, the, the channel uh, and the lobe. Um, and so we, we see that uh, the, the mud contains old terrestrial uh, organic carbon in here, so rather old, older compared to the uh, fine sands. Um, and then um, the fine sands have much younger uh, organic carbon compared to the muds and the coal sands, as you can see from the uh, uh, fraction modern uh, values. And then we have the coal sands, uh, which have uh, much older radiocarbon ages for all fractions, uh, particularly the last one is really old uh, in this uh, coal sand um, sample uh, that could indicate petrogenic organic matter. And so in summary, we have a, a sorting of organic carbon in the channel and lobe deposits according to grain size. Um, and the, so we have the petrogenic pool that we, we were finding from the river already, then the terrestrial biospheric pool, and then we have a new pool of fresh and young woody debris uh, associated with the fine sands on the left-hand side of, of the diagram. So if we combine everything, all these information, um, we can estimate that a channel and lobe organic carbon flux on a century time scale using these um, sedimentation rates of 1.9 centimeters a year is of about 10 uh, kilotons of organic carbon per year. Um, so let's now take a look at the uh, muddy overbanks and terraces. So located on the, um, uh, just outside of the, of the channel. And so you see that uh, from uh, the logs, they are much more muddy. Uh, in terms of grain size measurements, we measured that about uh, the, the mud contributes 80% of the total sediment composition in those uh, longer sediment cores. Then uh, it's followed by fine sands for 13% and then coarse sands. So we have thin beds still in the other banks and terraces uh, outside of the channel, but they are, they don't, they are not similar to the thick, thick turbidites that we retrieved in, from the channel calloid. In terms of a TOC content, uh, we see, we find quite similar values in the, for the mud and the coarse sands with very low TOC values. And we don't find this peak in TOC in the fine sands anymore from these uh, overbank um, uh, sediment cores. If we plot those cores um, here as um, circles, so the circles represent the different samples that we took. Uh, in the terrace and overbank sediment cores, we see that they all plot towards the biospheric to petrogenic pool. We have no, um, no dots or no fine sands uh, within the uh, fresh biospheric woody debris pool. So in total, the, we estimate that the overbank POC flux of a century time scale uh, is of about eight kilotons of organic carbon per year. And uh, the last uh, sub-environment I'd like to show you is this uh, distal flat basin in here, which is much more quiet. It's uh, downstream of the sandy lobe uh, of the turbidite system. It's, um, and and uh, because it's more quiet, we managed to get much longer sediment cores. Um, and I'm showing you here just the first two meters of a long sediment core that was located here on the site 15. Um, 
And this uh, two meters long sediment core uh, com comprises 55% uh, of gray looking mud and 45% of red looking mud. So it's all muddy, but with different facies in terms of colors at least. And in terms of uh, TOC content, we have high values of um, TOC in the red mats uh, and moderate values in the gray mats, so about 0.6%. Let's now plot those uh, distal samples as triangles uh, on the uh, 1 over TC versus delta C13 diagram. And um, you see here that the red mats um, plot on the carbon rich part of the diagram, and they show delta C13 values between minus 24 to minus 22, uh, which is typical for, um, for organic carbon of marine origin in the area. So it's been shown before in the Strait of Georgia, we have such values for the marine organic carbon. And then the gray muds plot towards uh, the um, moderate organic carbon pool, uh, and they tend to be slightly more terrestrial in terms of delta C13 values. But we see that we have a nice mixing in those, in those muds in the distal sites. If we look at some uh, RPO data in this long sediment core, um, so we managed to get um, fractions, to separate fractions on three samples. So two on the red mat in here, S1 and S3, and uh, one uh, in the gray mat, so S2 here. Uh, and we see that the main takeaway here is that the, the organic matter is much older uh, compared to um, the, the sandy channel. And we also have a, a spectrum of different uh, delta C13 values uh, with the red mud being uh, more associated to marine uh, values in terms of delta C13 as opposed to the gray mud. And so in um, total for this uh, distal, more quiet uh, site, we have about 14 uh, kilotons of organic carbon per year um, that is uh, being buried there. Um, and among which, Five is terrestrial, uh, so that corresponds to the gray mud, and 10 is marine, corresponds to the uh, red mud. And so this slide is just a, a very complex uh, summary uh, showing all the sub environments that we've, uh, uh, that I showed you earlier. Uh, they are all plotted together. So we have the uh, petrogenic pool, the uh, biospheric pool, the marine pool, and then the bacterial pool. Um, within the system. So the, the crosses represent the rivers and the rest are the submarine system. So we see that the um, weird looking delta C13 values associated to what we think are bacteria are not found in a great quantity within the submarine system. Um, so now I'd like to come back to our initial questions uh, and I'd like to try and compare them from source to sink basically. Um, so how much organic carbon is delivered by the rivers? Um, so I've showed you that our approximates uh, are, are of about 22 kilotons of organic carbon per year are flushed in the fjord uh, by uh, the two rivers. Uh, but here we are excluding the surface plumes, as I uh, mentioned earlier. And then let's compare this with how much um, organic carbon uh, is stored on the seafloor. Uh, we show that we have about 32 uh, kilotons of organic carbon per year, among which uh, 23 is terrestrial. Um, so if we discard the red marine muds in the distal side, we have about 23 kilotons of organic carbon, mostly terrestrial. So basically we have really um, surprisingly um, va comparable values between the rivers and the terrestrial uh, organic carbon buried in, in the seafloor. Uh, I guess we are sort of lucky here because we should really confirm those numbers with more tests, more samples, uh, covering more variability, uh, both in the river discharge, but also in the submarine system as well. Uh, we need more samples from the submarine of a bank's deposits to really test whether everything that's coming in from the river is buried within the system or not. And one thing also we really need is longer sediment cores in the, the sandy channel and low because we only we extrapolate our 30 centimeters long core um, to much longer uh, sediment succession, and we are not sure everything will be preserved, obviously. Uh, but this is what we've got, and, and um, this is also um, what we can tell from, uh, from the data we have. So where is organic carbon stored on the seafloor? 
uh, over centric time scales. So this is a plot uh, showing um, the different uh, surface area, uh, the, sorry, the contribution of the surface area to the total uh, fjord uh, area. So the, you see that the channel flow in white and lobe hair in white contribute uh, very few um, to the total fjord area, whereas the other banks and distal side take a much longer, a much larger surface area of the whole uh, butte inlet. And if we take a look now at the contributions of the organic carbon burial uh, budget for those different sub-environments, we see that even though the channel flow and lobe are really small in terms of surface area, they contribute about half of the terrestrial organic carbon burial to the total fjord uh, surface area. So that's quite interesting. Um, and if we um, take now a look at the actual values per square kilometers per year and compare them with the previous studies I mentioned in the introduction. So I've now here um, divided the, the organic carbon burial flux that we calculated in the submarine system by the butte surface area to get uh, unit, units in terms of tons of carbon per square kilometers per year. And so that we can co compare them with, the, with other studies uh, who showed, uh, for example, in those uh, muddy sediments from Kui et al, we have about 22 carbon per square kilometers per year. Whereas in our study, we have about two times this flux uh, only for the muddy sediment. And we should add the sandy sediment in there. And so our fluxes are really similar to the uh, fluxes by Smidal and Austin that have considered the different grain size um, in the in the fluxes calculation. So I think we should really um, take into account the grain size when, when trying to, to uh, close organic carbon budgets in, in heterogeneous uh, field seafloor. Um, and I also would like to, to quickly compare uh, our small scale butte inlet system uh, with a much larger and deeper uh, sea setting, uh, which is the uh, Congo Canyon um, offshore Africa. Uh, where really extensive work has been conducted uh, for the understanding of carbon for, for, from source to sink in a, in a turbidite system. So there was actually a, a talk uh, by uh, Christophe Rabouy in, uh, in this seminar series um, a few months ago. Uh, and in this system, it seems that the, that the muddy um, sub-environments, so the levees and low here, are, uh, dominate the carbon burial budget over the, the sandy uh, canyon and, sa and, and channel, which have almost none uh, carbon buried. So this is quite different conclusion uh, compared to our results. Um, and, and we deal with, uh, with the similar century timescales in both uh, studies. And so this brings me to a last few slides, I think, uh, a last few discussion, discussion points that I'd like to make. And, um, I'd like to ponder a bit more on the question of time in this uh, source to sink uh, organic carbon transport. So I, I have shown you that um, carbon burial rates that should, that should hold for the recent hundred, for the past hundred years, um, under the assumption that the 30 centimeters long sediment cores in the channel will be reproduced over those hundred years. But this actually might not be the case because we know from the turbidity current uh, and seafloor monitoring data that those uh, deposits have probably been reworked, reworked uh, a few days later or months after collection. So, so my question is, um, where will the organic rich fine sands end up? Are they going to end up in the channel, on the lobe, uh, further downstream? Uh, that's really a question I'd like to answer. Are they going to, to be reoxidized after a while? And um, we can sort of, uh, elude on these uh, uh, questions uh, by looking um, at slightly longer sediment cores that we took in a similar channel setting in House Sound, which is a fjord south of Butte Inlet, where we managed to get two meters long sediment cores. And where you see actually that only the, the, the coarse sand to fine sand are preserved. The mud caps are sort of removed away uh, by erosion of the turbidity cones in the much thicker, in the much longer succession of the core. Uh, so how much fine sands will make it in the longer succession is really a question we should uh, consider in, in our butte setting. And I also here showing, I'm showing you here uh, eight meters long sediment cores in this distal more um, quiet setting 
from which I had shown you just the first two meters in the previous slides, but we have a six more meters um, in this uh, site, uh, which are displayed here. And within those uh, much older sediments uh, that are several centuries uh, old, we have fine sands that are rich in, in a woody debris. And that could be similar to the fine sands we observed in, in further upstream in the modern submarine channel. And so we think that those deep fine sands that made it down there in the distal site here, just to remind you the location it was here, could be a result of large scale turbidity terms that occur on a much less frequent basis uh, compared to the ones that we have managed to observe so far in, in the channel induced inlets. Uh, and so those large scale events, flushing events, could play a role in redistribu redistributing sorry, organic carbon on the seafloor at this much more distal uh, site and uh, over much longer time scales. And um, we have uh, actually an event of this type uh, occurred uh, last year on the 28th of November, 2020. Um, so th there was a glacial outburst flood uh, that um, triggered a, a terrestrial landslide in the area uh, of the Southgate watershed in here. And it brought in a lot of material and trees at the head of the of Butte Inlet. And we think this could have uh, been flushed over the, the submarine channel and probably uh, further downstream. And it's really on the way. We have uh, new data coming. Uh, to analyze these sort of, the impact of these sort of events on the uh, preservation of organic carbon in, in such settings. And I think I've got one uh, last slide um, that I'd like to go back even deeper in time, in time and think about uh, the geologic record, how much of these deposits that we observed will actually be preserved in the rock record and enter the long-term uh, carbon cycle. That's really an enigmatic uh, question to me, at least for our deposits that we observe in the modern environment. Um, but uh, evidence exists uh, for the preservation of woody debris associated with sands and turbidites in ancient uh, exhumed rocks. So um, here is an example uh, from a, a site in, in Chile uh, where we managed to uh, study a, a long um, succession uh, that, that's about 75 million, million years old. Um, and we uh, observed very fresh woody debris uh, associated with fine sands in, in turbidite deposits, or at least what we think are turbidite deposits from a river connected system. And uh, last example will also come from the Bengal fan, where they managed to drill a long sediment core at a, at a IODP site, um, where they recovered up to 19 million, million years old deposits. Uh, and they found again fresh woody debris such in such a large and, and old site. But again, my question will be, how much do these organics represent compared to what was actually deposited down there back in time? Have we lost a lot of carbon or are we seeing only past exceptional carbon fluxes in the rock record? And I guess I'll leave you with this uh, question. And um, there is a bit of time for questions, I think, and I'd like to thank everyone for, for listening. Thank you very much, Sophie. This is a great, great talk. You. And, you know, as we all know, uh, we tried to, a uh, decade ago, we tried to understand how much the global river delivered the organic carbon to the ocean. But now it looks like the inlet, particularly the high latitude, the glacial faded one, the event driving one could be delivered much more, much more than we earlier uh, estimated so uh, okay now open the floor to the to our audience if you have any question you're not able to unmute yourself go ahead to ask sophie okay yeah tom hi sophie hi tom uh, yeah hi it's really fantastic uh talk very interesting Thank i you. enjoyed it tremendously um i have a, a question um related to two things. One is the, um, with your transit from the submarine channel to the deeper uh, deposits where the muds are, do you have any feel for um, the oxygen, how the oxygen exposure time with particles moving across that gradient may vary with different seasons? Um, that's one thing. And then the other thing that's sort of more minor is, is um, I think it's interesting with 
the blue, the blue green algae bac bacteria idea with the uh, more enriched uh, C13, but have you totally excluded the idea of any uh, C4 grassy inputs? I know there may be some patches in and around parts of British Columbia that uh, represent small um, um, systems, you know, relative to trees. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. The, your, your second question is really interesting. I think uh, we, we thought about those C4 sources, but we, we thought also that it was not the place to have such C4 grasses. Uh, so if you say that there could be patches of such grass, yeah, why not then? That could be a possibility. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess they would be consumed within the water, at the water surface, because we don't see them at the seafloor anymore. Uh, so something, yeah, to, to look at, definitely. Uh, maybe looking at those uh, samples uh, under the microscope could, could help as well, because at the moment we just have um, C13, C14, and COC values, but we haven't really looked at what these particles look like in a, under a microscope. So yeah, it could be. And as you for your first question, the uh, oxygen exposure time, that's really something I have to dive into. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. I know there is some oxygen um, in, the, in the waters of, of Butte Inlet, uh, slightly, I think, higher than, than what we would think. Uh, but um, do they have an impact on the transit time? And how much time actually do we need to consume um, organic carbon under the presence of oxygen? It's really some, something I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Any? Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Anybody else? This is Gary Parker. I've got a question. Uh, Gary, go ahead. Okay, um, your talk as a whole was quite fascinating, um, but I was struck by something earlier in your talk. I could be wrong. The uh, Butte Inlet turbidity currents, you had velocities up to six meters a second. Is that right? Yes, yeah. That's Just pretty good. The, the, the fast head, yeah. It didn't last for two hours for six meters per second, but the fast short head uh, reach up to six meters per second. Okay. Uh, the second thing, this isn't about carbon, but it's uh, one of my favorite topics. Um, we saw nick points sequentially migrating upstream. Mm -hmm. Just my comment is I'm pretty sure that's not a single nick point every now and then forming. These are trains of nick points. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They are different nick points in the channel. Yeah. Mechanistically, they're cyclic steps. They're caused by some critical, supercritical flow going through hydraulic jumps. And as an interesting comment, right now we're working on them in the terrestrial environment um, in the Lurs Plateau of China. And uh, the ones that you showed in the um, uh, Butte Fjord and a sub, sub submarine environment are almost dead ringers for the one we see on the Lurs Plateau. Oh, nice. Okay. That's really, really nice to know. Thanks. Yeah. And yeah, maybe I didn't mention it well, but it, there are definitely trains of nick points and smaller scale cyclic steps as well, smaller scale bed forms at the, in the proximal part of the, of the fjord as well. So there are different uh, scales of bed forms down there. This is a, a really amateurish question, but I assume that deep in the fjord, it's probably an oxid. There probably aren't many mechanisms to uh, release carbon, right? Yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure about the values in terms of oxygen concentrations, uh, but I assume it's more quiet uh, in the deep, deep side, yeah. Okay, thank you, very nice talk. Thank you, thanks. Okay, hey Sophie, uh, you know, uh, in the system you are working on built, uh, a built inlet, you know, uh, it's a very dynamic compare those large river system like uh, the uh, Mississippi or, or Mississippi River or Amazon, that with a lots of fine particles suspended load, you know, they carry on delivered to the ocean. But in this system, so violent, you know, it's a, I assume the physical mixing should be much stronger than the large river system. This is back to Tom's question. How much oxygen involved? How about the burning rate of this organic carbon after they, yeah. you know, deliver? I assume it should be much faster than a large river system? Yeah, I guess it's really, really active, at least in the summer. Um, but they are also really fast and quick processes. So I'm not sure um, that oxygen uh, 
could com could uh, consume uh, organic matter that fast. I'm, uh -huh. I'm not actually sure. Um, so there are a lot of buried. transit and transfer from the turbidity currents, but yeah, yeah. Is, is there enough time to consume uh, organic carbon in a two hours long flow? I'm not sure. It's really something we could test maybe in experiments or something like okay. that. Okay, so that means they can bury it preserved quickly. And they, and they are preserved quickly, but also we worked quickly as well and re-exhumed ah. again and, and then re-preserved and re-exhumed. And, okay. and what's left in the end in the rock record, I guess it's the last cycle. That, I see. Um, that and at the, at the same time, maybe not so many fresh, newly generated marine carbon at the end. You know, Lord River Estuary always, you know, the primary production high mixed. Exactly, together. yeah. Actually, yeah. in the turbidite system, we, we see we don't see any marine organic carbon at the moment. Ah. So because it's so active, it doesn't have time to create marine to produce marine organic carbon. So there's only terrestrial organic carbon. The only side where we see and where there is time to create a marine organic carbon is the quiet and distal sites in view mm. That's that's very good. That's very good. Okay, anybody else? Um, if no, uh, Sophie, thank you very much. And uh, this, is a, this is a great, great talk. And uh, we, we gradually get more and more high latitude, you know, the river and uh, that kind of the system. It's a, it's a beautiful, great. Thank you so much. So- Thank you. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah. Once again, this talk is also archived on the YouTube. It will be ready in a couple of minutes. So thank you. Okay. Thanks. Good.